the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, geese were pretty much on the brink of extinction. So Canada and the United States got together. <laughs> Migratory geese. So Canada and um, the U.S. got together. They made a Atlantic Flyway Council and treaties. So long story short, they got protected. Uh, you, you needed to get permits and stuff. The, the, the reason I mention that is that was 100 years ago. You know government. It's not going to move very quick. So we're never getting rid of that treaty. It's not going to go through the Senate and get rid of it. So that's why we need permits and special permission to manage the population. Geese in New Jersey uh, started with, after the, um, the goose populations went down, people still wanted to hunt. So they brought in live geese as decoys. They made it so they couldn't fly. There were also goose farms that were in the area. And then in the 60s, the USDA, this, I don't think they'll make this part of their presentation, but they helped to bring back the geese numbers by putting nests in New Jersey. Um, so we have that, but they, they paid for that within 25 years where they realized it was a problem because these geese weren't leaving. We're also, um, New Jersey really is a good spot for geese. We, we have these corporate parks that all have a pond. That's, that's like the Arctic tundra they like. It's short grasses with access to a water, 360 degree view. So we've created the perfect habitat for them. Golf courses, lake clubs also go into that. Large houses on a lake. If you have a large house with a lawn, you're probably going to get geese coming up onto your lake every now and then. But it's really the 80s and 90s that this uh, reached a nuisance level. I have a particular interest in geese because my sister once stepped on a bee whose stinger was contaminated with goose fecal matter. And as a kid, I remember the doctor drawing a line on her leg as the infection spread up. And if it crossed the line, they had to take a serious step. It didn't, so we're all good. Um, the geese, though, over the years, they, they've adapted really quickly. If you notice geese now, they, 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 they literally look both ways before crossing the road. They are amazingly adaptable, so we have to be adaptable to chase them off the lake. Not one method is going to work. They, they love our landscape. We have the short lawns, but besides that, in the winter, they've adjusted. You see them in fields. Have you been up in Warwick in like late fall? You'll see geese all over the field eating the leftovers of the cow corn on no farm or whatever they cut down, but the geese are out there in the fields, they can eat year round now. They don't need the water necessarily. They don't even need the grass to grow. They'll find food in our area. And they can also go quite a while without eating, 30 days. So it's the perfect urban bird. Uh, they've really adjusted to this and the urban environment suits them well. First off, they don't really have predators out there in the urban environment. There's no hunters, people will tend to feed the geese, so they've adapted well to that. And because of this, because they don't have to migrate or take any real chances, they, have, they actually do a lot better than migratory geese. They breed at a younger age, they produce larger clutches, and they have a lower mortality rate. We're even seeing in some of the literature that geese, resident geese are now reproducing at two years of age instead of three to four that it takes for a migratory geese. And it's probably because they're just living a fat life at our lakes and lawns and all that. And here's some stats. This is actually from April. Um, you can just see the, the real point I want to, the real thing here that you should take away is really this, how well the urban geese do in their numbers versus the rural geese. So even in New Jersey, the geese up here in Sparta have a tougher time than the geese in Bergen County or some of those lakes that are really, really uh, crowded in. So again, here's their environment. They like those large grassy fields. They want a view of their surroundings. Geese, you're not gonna see them too often, although they're changing every two years as another generation, but you're not gonna see them too often under a deck or in an enclosed place. They, I'm not saying they'll never be there, but that's not their preferred environment. They love our lakes, a quiet peninsula. If you have an island in your lake and you do egg addling, I know Gary's here from Erskine Lake, they have an island, they know right where to go to get their geese. Ends of peninsulas, quiet places but that's not the only places they'll go. Here's our resident goose population. I'm not quite sure, I believe. I don't think we're down almost half from that high, but uh, this is the level that they say is sustainable. I, I think it really should be a little lower, but because um, we were having problems in the early 90s when we were at that level. New Jersey has a lot of people per square mile. New Jersey has a lot of geese per square mile. That's, that's uh, just something we got to deal with. So in other states, when we look at other programs in other states, 4.5 is, is, is an order of magnitude above just about every, it's double if not more than every other state. So it is a more Jersey problem than elsewhere. 
You, I'll show this to you again, but since we're talking about the goose behavior, this is really their pattern during the year. So we are in March to April right now. They're starting to mate, and any day now, they're going to start making their nests. After that, they go through a molt, they have their goslings, then they go through a molt, and then they start pond hopping again. That's really their yearly cycle. This will be important when we start talking about some of the techniques to get rid of geese. So the geese are adapting. If, if you ask me, I'm no scientist, but they are, are different species of migratory geese at this point. They exhibit different behaviors. They live in different areas. They're different sizes. But uh, I don't know what the definition is to make it a new species, but we can't treat them like migratory geese. They, their behaviors and everything they do is different. Um, seeing them take off straight up, that is a huge natural advantage they have over migratory geese. Migratory geese need a runway to take off. They take off at like a 14 degree angle and you'll see them running or swimming and flapping their feet on the water to get flight. Resident geese don't do that anymore. Resident geese are taking straight up. They can land on a rooftop. They can land on a triangular rooftop, drop themselves right down. Migratory geese aren't doing that. Their diet, as we talked about earlier, they, they don't just need the young sprouts. There's food all over in our, our neighborhoods and area. They're also uh, more territorial than migratory geese. They, they, they get a spot, they will fight with other geese. So you'll see that on your lake, this time of year especially, as they're starting to nest. They will protect their area and they don't want other people around. So let's take a look at some of these new nesting sites. This is not a common goose site. This, this historically couldn't have happened. This is impossible 100 years ago. A goose is not gonna land and make a nest in a planter. They can do that now because they're, they're the way they can take off. You might find them on a roof. So when you're going to addle eggs, it's tough to find all your nests. You'll find them on your islands at your beach. But don't be surprised if a goose nest is on the corner of a roof and then they come down and to your lake with their goslings. I don't know how. This, this one is three stories up in an HVAC area. This is actually from a, a professional company that um, shared this. And I don't know how the goslings get down three stories, but that's not my problem. <laughs> Old d abandoned things. New Jersey has a lot of uh, brown space, a lot of spaces that we have left. They're great for geese, right? They're, we don't have the predators coming through, so they can nest in old dumpsters, you name it. They can even nest on a bunch of fake flowers on someone's porch. <laughs> this is not what you want to wake to, up to every morning. Another um, abandoned strip mall. The geese is there in a trash-filled planter. So what does this mean for you? Well, it actually doesn't mean too much for lake managers because we still are their desirable ancestral pattern. Our lakes fit what they want going back thousands of years. So in some ways it doesn't matter, but the, the key is this traveling two miles with their young goslings. If they're nesting anywhere in your neighborhood, if they're nesting in a strip mall two miles away, they'll end up on your lake. Your lake is very attractive to raise a family and they're adjusting. They realize now that they need to nest somewhere and raise somewhere. That's no longer their nest needs to be right next to where they're gonna raise their clutch. So for example, if you, if you look at that two mile, and that's actually old, that's 1991 data. I bet you they can go three or four miles now, but if you look at that two mile radius, this is Bud Lake right here in the center. It's about a mile long, a little over a mile long. So if you go two miles out in a circumference, you got residences here, 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 there's a, a pretty big road, a diner here, so commercial businesses. This is the area you would really have to consider covering for a complete addling program. And normally, we'll just be going along the edge of the lake, maybe a little bit into a park looking for a nest. But now, it almost makes it impossible for an addling program on its own to work. So if a professional vendor comes in and tells you they're going to put up a static dog and addle, that's probably not going to solve your problem. So again, the best practices still apply from the last 30 years, but we now need to, we're forced to get into a mix of the different practices. The geese always adjust. I'm a live person doing 3,000 trips to chase the geese and they adjust to me. They learned my work schedule. They literally, I was going to work dressed up. This is dressed up for me. And I'm going to work and I'm getting, <laughs> it is a little overdressed. I'm going to work and um, I, I get into my car. I live on lakefront. Honk, honk, honk. I see them come in as I'm leaving, 8.40, and I'm like clockwork. 8.40, I'm, son of a gun. I go, I pull on my pants, you know, my overalls, get in the boat, 
chase them. Next day, they're not there at 8.40. My wife calls me. Yeah, they, they got here at 9. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to adjust my work schedule. I work from home now more. I did that before COVID, thanks to the geese. It wasn't just the geese, but it, it did work out. Um, so they're going to adjust. So the effigies you put out, the silhouettes of dogs, hanging eyeballs, we'll get into all that, but it needs to be rotated. And you're going to need to figure out the schedule of the professional harassment company, because if they come at the same time Wednesday morning at 11 a.m., the geese will be like, oh, it's 11, let's, let's hang out, let's go to that other pond for a few hours, and then we'll come back. They will, they will get used to it. Um, it can't be done with your, you can't hire this out to a professional company, expect great results. It needs to be a community thing. So we're going to talk about a community plan soon. And uh, really, we're just trying to do is make them as uncomfortable as possible so they choose another site. That doesn't always work, and we'll get into that. So community management. This is really the, the crux of the presentation today, is how to bring everyone together. Um, lake managers want them off the beaches. The animal welfare advocates want them protected. General membership wants to not have poop on their feet. They don't want their kids exposed to the different, the real risks of goose poop infecting kids. Um, as I told before, I have personal experience with that. And um, lifeguards don't want to do that type of job either. I, I don't know if you're having the same trouble we are with lifeguards, but we're sort of putting them on a pedestal now and saying, just save lives, we'll, we'll handle the rest of it. So someone's got to get out there and, and scoop the poop if uh, you don't have, and it, it helps if you have those volunteers available to do that. You got to bring together a compromise, but um, it's one of my favorite movies, but this guy, Quint, you're not going to call him in and he's going to solve your problem. It's just not possible. So why make the plan? Um, you need the whole community to work. You need people to tell you, do they have a nest in the woods behind their house? It's great if they can communicate that to you because that'll make your egg addling program more successful. Uh, you really don't want to risk a membership decline because you're doing something good for the lake. You don't want a, a situation where you go into goose management without a plan or privately and get people to turn off to your lake or even worse, form a resistance group. Because um, without that information, people will assume the worst motives. They think that you're just a cold, heartless person who likes to see geese die. Um, and you may be, but you don't want that image to get out. <laughs> Um, so it's better to be open to suffer the protests and, um, and all that. So, you know, here's uh, SaveNewJerseyGeese.com is a thing. People have put up billboards. It really only takes one or two members. I, people who have been on lake boards know what it's like when that member gets agitated, when you stir the hornet's nest. It might be a goose issue, it might be something else, but when it's a goose issue, they can actually go and bring in outside help. It's not that hard for them to bring in people to your neighborhood. They will tell you it's, it's, it's this negative press that you want to avoid. It can get worse. So I'm on here. This is Cup Salt Lake right here. We are identified on a public site as a goose killer. We, are, we haven't killed geese since 2010, but we made it. Uh, yeah, you might see your lake up there. This is a spot they share. This is something that's out there for people. Um, the, the, the key with Cupsaw is we, we're on there because in 20, for a couple of years, we weren't sure if our deterrent efforts were going to work. So part of our compromise is we contracted with the USDA. You have to contract with them basically in October if you want to have a roundup in late June, early July. So we contracted it with them and said, if we need you to, please kill them. If you don't, great. But that puts us on the list because it's a government record that Cupsaw Lake has reached out to the USDA to authorize a goose cull depredation, I think is the USDA term. So you'll be on their map, they will check these records, and they may visit your lake. Um, the worst part about it is uh, for these guys that you probably hire, the USDA, uh, they like to come at 5 in the morning, and that's not just because they're early risers, it's to try to get this out of the public view. People will come down and protest. They'll mobilize quicker than you can think, than you would imagine. So um, what we need is that plan, and the plan will help because you're going to bring in the stakeholders. No one's going to be happy, but you can reach a consensus. Um, these are all things we're, I'll cover next. You know, tips from the experts, how to create that plan. Get word out about the plan. It's not necessarily that you want the plan posted on public meeting boards, but you do want people to know you're working under a plan, and uh, your board members should be able to talk to it. So there's really two types of stakeholders that it comes down to. You have the like, kill them all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them, and then you have the, the save the geese. These are the two most motivated people that are, are, you're gonna bring into your tent here as you make a community plan. 
And this is what the lake manager sees. They see the dirt, they also see the conflict. I mean, I love this, this series of pictures. I, I don't know who that golfer is, but that goose <laughs> kicked his butt. Um, that's not typical, but um, that's a pretty full grown sized human. Imagine your four or five year old at the edge of a beach where they've been feeding the geese and the geese are uh, used to those, those people. These pictures are actually mine. Um, I'm no animal activist, but I don't want to kill anything unnecessary either. But uh, they are cute, and this is really what they see. They see, I mean, that little fuzzball, I wish, you know, it's like a tribble from Star Trek. I wish I could just keep it in that little tiny fuzzy state, but unfortunately it turned into that, and they poop. So understanding both sides is really important. We went over this, the fecal coliform, and the animal activists will say, all animals belong on your lake. It's a natural thing, and the animals should be there. So these are the general tips from the expert. This is from a document I'll, I'll, I have referenced at the end. It's a um, 1991 document out of Cornell University, They're one of their extension offices. You want to determine, so this is the, the tips to make your plan and what to put in it. You want to determine the extent of the problems. You want to outline that. What is the goal of your plan? Is it fecal coliform you're worried about in the water? Is it the beach itself? Is it um, Usually it's going to be the droppings, right? Does anyone have any other big problems with geese? Is it droppings that we're most concerned about? Okay. And feel free to stop me in the middle if you have questions. I'll, I'll look for hands. Um, but no single management technique's going to be um, effective, so you're going to need buy-in from community because the more people that can help you with this, the better. At Cupsaw, with our one-mile, 66-acre lake, we probably have 10 people involved in the program with six of them cleaning up goose poop. It's not possible to eliminate all the geese in a given area over a, a period of time. If you are a lake association with a beach, if you have steep rock walls in your lake's a quarry, maybe, but if you have any type of grass near the lake, you're not going to be able to get rid of them all. And there's no single quick fix. You can do a roundup and your lake will now be open for the next batch of geese to come. They will look at your lake in the fall and then they will decide to nest there in the spring. And goose um, management, it's really for us, right? We want to meet our own needs with it. And modifying uh, the behaviors of the geese is what we're going for. And that's what your plan will include. So how many geese are acceptable? That is a tough number. Um, it depends on your lake, how many geese you have traditionally. Some lakes aren't as desirable as others. Other lakes have multiple beaches where the geese can go from one spot of the lake to the other to avoid any of your harassment, checked, um, harassment activities. You will need to talk to your stakeholders about appropriate control techniques. The Humane Society has good information on goose management. It's great to reference when you have an animal activist there. It's sort of like uh, someone who text, talks about a no-kill shelter. Well, a no-kill shelter is like a temporary housing. Eventually those dogs get moved to a kill shelter. So. Um, the Humane Society understands that. They understand the balance between animal populations and human populations. You'll want to talk to the community about the management, hand and the management plan, and sometimes if you bring in a stakeholder who is an animal activist, they will be able to communicate that message better than you can. He just wants to, assuming you want the geese just gone. Look at your program over each year to see what's worked and what doesn't, and adjust it, and then make sure that plan is known to people. So t setting that goal is, is tough. Cupsaw is a 66-acre uh, lake, 65 acres, and we, our goal right now is at six adult geese. Um, it was eight, and we're down to six because we've had some good success at keeping the geese away, and we haven't used a lethal mean, including egg addling. Uh, we haven't used that for 12 years now. So this is about one goose per 10 acres of water. I don't know if that'll work for your lake. It's really up to you. Uh, but I will say it's an aggressive goal and requires a lot of management. So some of the factors you want to look at to see if you can even hit this number. Are your geese nesting on the lake or are they walking in? If they're nesting on the lake, you, that's a pretty easy situation to get under control. But if you have an area where they're nesting and you won't be able to find their nest, that makes it extremely difficult to figure that out. Are there areas where geese are not in the way? In other words, is your lake big enough, I don't know if anyone's lake is big enough, where you have a beach or a field that's natural, a natural end of the lake that you can harass the geese over to? Because if so, you can harass them year round and you might be able to keep them off your property. And what's the membership gonna 
accept. Um, if you have a small membership and they're very pro-animal, you might have a higher target. If you're in an urban setting and no one wants geese around, you might be able to get a little more leeway. Because if they accept a low number and you get people to agree on it, you can do enhanced techniques. So this is like just sort of business stuff. Define your plan, take the right steps, anything you would do on any other plan in basically any other industry or um, any other purpose. So there are some control techniques that we'll cover. Um, make sure you list them in your plan and make sure you have an escalatory procedure. So if your first control technique is uh, putting up a fence around nesting sites, great. If the geese are still there, then you might do harassment with dogs. And if your geese have a big bumper crop of goslings and you're looking at a rough summer coming up, you may want to have that lethal option defined in the plan because people will accept the lethal option when you've taken a lot of steps to avoid it. Um, one of my favorite quotes from LB, LBJ is, better to have them in the tent pissing out than out of the tent pissing in. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> really what you want to do with this plan. And <laughs> And if you need a technique or come up with something that's not in your plan, don't hide it from that stakeholder. That could cause trouble. Make sure you, you update them when you update the plan. So some timelines here. If, if you haven't put the plan together already, start working on next year's. Uh, it's uh, any day now they're going to be putting eggs near your lake. Um, here's a permit site. Has anyone been to this? Yes, okay. So this is the egg addling site. Uh, it's real easy to register. I've been registered for 12 years. Never addled an egg, but I register every year just in case I find that nest. I never <laughs> found a nest. Not once. And I've looked, I've tracked them, I've had my wife stand at one of the eggs Why I chase them and where'd they go? No, nope. it's a mystery. They, they, all those pictures I showed you, they must have found some other spot. Maybe they're up in trees now. I really don't know. They're under your porch. They, they could be, <laughs> but they don't like they don't like enclosed spaces. That's a new, that's a new thing. That could be a new thing. Yeah, I, I should look. I leave it open actually. Hmm. Thanks. Um, so by March is really your your plan should be a active by then. Right around now is where if you have a team that's going to add eggs, you want to teach them how to add it. We'll get into that a little more. Those details. You want to make sure you're registered. Uh, you'll addle by April. So you have a couple, what, a week, I think, until, until you're going to need to start at addling. And then June's when you're going to make the decision. That's when the birds become flightless. That's your only option for a roundup. And if you if you had a bad year and you weren't ready for a roundup, it, it's, I don't, April Simnor could tell you, I don't know the what constitutes an emergency and what doesn't for them to give you permission to do a roundup without having gone through it for uh, since October of the previous year. But if you want to do a roundup, you got to look there. Yeah, yes. I just can't read that website. Can you? Uh, what is the website? Oh, I, I don't even know. It's um, just if you search for resident Canada goose registration. Uh, this will be. We will post the slideshow too. Oh. And I'll tell you what. I'll put the links. Do you? I'll put the links on our website and Facebook as well. I don't have too many links in the presentation, so I'll get that up by the end of the weekend. So the plan should be public and dynamic. Make it available on request. Make sure your board members know about the plan. I, I know there may be a board member who just manages uh, your social affairs. But if they're going to vote on the plan, they should know about it because they should be able to speak to people when they're concerned. It's important that the people who are against goose management are uh, uh, they're advised of the steps you're taking. They're advised as soon as they're asking questions. You don't want to put them off especially if they see people harassing the geese and stuff. This plan should be evaluated yearly. Uh, I think at first you'll add more deterrent methods and you'll figure it out, but then after a year or two, you'll probably settle into a, a yearly plan that covers all your options. It's not always easy to reach an agreement. When you bring in the two parties to a table and one is literally saying, I'll kill them all, I'll poison them, whatever it takes, and the other is like, all animals should live, it can lead to some, some controversy. The Humane Society can bring in a representative if you have someone or they, because they, I think of all the animal rights groups, they seem to understand it best. Um, if you can't bring that in, consider a board member from another lake that's done it. We have NJ Cola trustees that might be able to, to help with a meeting. 
But really, if all else fails, you have April Sidnor, and I forget her counterpart in South Jersey, uh, but you have two representatives from the USDA. The NJDEP is actually pretty light on this topic, but may be able to help, or even just a local official, basically a mediator, because it, it can get pretty heated. Anyone have questions on the plan itself or the elements before we get into harassment? Yes. Um, what actual action do you have? You haven't been specific with, like, you don't, you told me you don't do Adeline, you don't. Deterrence habitat modification and lethal means? I'm getting to that next. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll get into the actual elements of that. Yes, sir. Some of the added things are water quality. The food species affects the water quality, so it could stop people from swimming in your lake. Also, the nutrients add to the vegetation in the lake as well. Yes, and I didn't even bring up nutrients, but yes, they, uh, Anyone who's been to these meetings knows four geese equal one septic system. That's, that's the mantra from Steve Souza. But yeah, that is a problem. Water quality certainly is. Um, I think as lake managers, that's a good way to approach it. For your membership, it's poop on their feet, you know, where they step. To them, that's the clear thing. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a good point. And it's a good one to raise. Yes? So is there, anyone who is idling eggs needs to register? Yes. What if you have two people, one's helping? Can just the one person register? If, you know, it, the organization? You need to register. You actually can register as a person. I register as a private citizen, but I can cover the, the lake area. But can we cover as, a, as an officer of the lake? Can you cover it for the lake? Yeah, if you have your, your permit and you tell them the area you're working in, yes, you can do that. Now, if you're going to go to a private homeowner's property, your permit doesn't shield you, give you any type of permission for, for that. That's that still trespassing. Yes? I just want to be sure I'm clear. If the Lake Association were to get a permit for Adelaide, since the homeowners are owners of that lake community, can they also align with that permit and take care of Adelaide on their own properties? No, they would need to register themselves. Okay. And whoever's doing the Adelaide should be registered on the site. Permits are like $2. Actually, egg addling is free. Is it? Yep, that's why I do it every year. Okay. <laughs> so literally, it's a calendar appointment. I don't know. It's workflow. Take it. Move on. You know, it's just mindless. Yes? Is there any resistance from animal activists for about addling? Yes, there is. And we'll get to that soon. That, that's next in the show. I actually have a, a little poster in, in here of showing that too. But it's a lot better, right, than, uh, I'll get to it, but than what that roundup looks like when they all get put in the back of a U-Haul. So let's talk about executing the plan now. And we'll talk about choosing a professional, the three components of deterrence, site aversion, habitat modification, and curtailing reproduction, and then the decision on the roundup and what the planning you have to do ahead of time as well as the options. These are just some of the vendors that are available in the area. But uh, you know, beware of this. We never and will never euthanize Canada geese. That sounds good, and if that's the plan your lake associates come up with, if that's options off the table, this might be a really good vendor to work with. Unless that option's off the table, you'll need another vendor. So you still want your, even if you bring in the professional though, you still want this plan because you don't want your professional getting harassed. When we talk to, when I talk to the professionals that do this, they tell me that they get harassed as well. They get yelled at or people in their way, but you can't stop them, right? They, they, they're doing, what they're doing is legal and if someone gets in their way, then you have a real conflict. And we'll need the gentleman in the back of the room to help us out with that. Um, professionals can help take the burden off you as board members. So you can contract with the company. Again, they're not going to solve all your problems, but they can help that, take that burden off you. The USDA is there to help. April Simnor and her counterpart in South Jersey are very open to you calling them, emailing them, and they will respond. This is what they do. Um, and shop around to see what's the best fit. If you have a plan, that's a great, basically an RFP, or a request for proposal that you can send to these companies. So they know what you want out of the plan, what help they can get, and give you a proper, proper price. Um, just in town, when we considered this year bringing in a professional firm for four fields, we're looking at uh, quotes of 30,000 plus for four baseball fields, basically. That's insane. That's, that's a, an insane cost. Uh, beware of false promises. Um, 
Goose control without lethal may, means really may not be possible. If you have a large unwieldy population that's been at your lake for years, there's nothing you can do to get them off short of killing them. That's their home, they will come back. And I shouldn't say nothing, if you had people on the lake 24 seven with boats, flashlights at night, using lasers and a combination of techniques and dogs, you could do it. But um, you're, you're evicting them from the home and resident geese do not want to leave their home. They come from geese whose wings were clipped and used as decoys, they're not going anywhere. Um, so just be careful of that. Beware of promises to have the geese chased away by a once a week visit where they rotate their, their dog. This dog, you can buy this on, oops, wrong button. You can buy this dog on Lowe's. It's pretty cheap and you get what you pay for. If your goose problem is new though, then you have a better chance of these harassment and habitat modification techniques working. So static techniques, they can be effective though. You put that dog into your yard and, or a dog on your beach, and even geese that have been at your beach will take a little while to get used to it, but they will get used to it. Move the dog around a little, you might extend another week or two, bring in a live dog and have that dog there. Now you're talking, now you're mixing techniques and the geese are thinking, all right, is that dog real or not? But they will adjust quick, it's just a picture to them. Beware of assumptions. My assumption I have to battle every year on our lake where are the swans? Don't they keep the geese away? No. No, they don't. Um, why do people think that they keep the geese away? Because swans and geese are fighting all the time. If they're fighting all the time, it means the geese are there. Like, <laughs> that's what people are seeing. They're seeing the swans chase the geese, but they don't chase them off the lake. They don't even care that much. Swans chase each other, geese chase each other. It's just part of their territorial dispute. It doesn't mean anyone's leaving. Geese also have some behaviors that people don't account for. That They'll swim underwater during the molt. They'll, they'll dive down. They can go 30, 40 yards underwater. You ever see a goose swim? It seems unnatural to me. They float like a cork, but then they can go down for sometimes a minute or two. Um, I learned this by chasing them during the molt early on when I didn't quite understand it. That was the only way to escape, but they, they could escape underwater. So site aversion is really about making the geese uncomfortable. They will move on. Um, if they've been there for years, you're not gonna do it. This is the Meadowlands right here. The site aversion isn't the sprinkler, it's these little pieces of Mylar tape. So that's one thing they're trying to do on this field. I guess for them, they just don't want geese or any type of bird going on those fields. Live animals are better than decoys, moving better than static. If you have sprinklers on a motion timer, that, that can help keep them off a spot. Again, though, we're talking about some pretty serious expense there. If you have mylar tape like they have here, you're gonna need wind. If your beach area or something's in a windless cove on your lake that only gets wind from the east or west, you're probably not gonna get too much action on those uh, flags. And then when you're considering deterrent methods, consider your homeowners around the lake. If you put a big flashing light up to keep the goose from nesting at night, people aren't gonna wanna see a big flashing light on their beautiful dark lake. So, Keep that in mind, and again, with a plan at least, you might be able to assuage their concerns, let them know flashing lights are only up in April and May when the geese are nesting. March, April, and May. So what we try to do with site aversion is make predator threats. That's not just a goose resting under a, the effigy, that's a goose nesting under the effigy. So they will be wary of predators. They, they wanna go, don't we all? I mean. I don't want to live in a house with some creep. <laughs> I don't want a predator in my house, a, a tiger. So they, they're the kind of the same way. They, they, they will at first be scared of these things. So eyeball balloons, those look like bird's eyes. They look ridiculous to us as hopefully higher functioning animals than geese. But um, they, they mimic the eyeball and as they blow around makes the geese uncomfortable. Is it gonna you know, scare the hell out of them? No, is it gonna make them uncomfortable? Yes. In low light conditionings, this light, this light is $400, geese away, $400 light. Just, just get a traffic thing. The traffic thing's like $30. Stick it on a PVC pipe and you've got a, a flashing thing. They work pretty well. Um, if you get a goose site where they're nesting, pop one of these in and you might see them not nest for a few days there, but they will come back. Um, other things I've seen used and we have used, blow up yard decorations that work on a remote control. It senses it, blows that little guy up and scares him. Sprinklers, noisemakers. There's automatic lasers. 
I don't trust them. I'm using one now. This is actually very effective for chasing geese. You shine it at their feet and they'll, they'll run away. But lasers on an automatic timer, I would use a lot of caution with. First of all, if they tell you it's in a light band that humans can't see, well, it means geese can't see them too. Our, our eyes are very similar in the band of light we both see. They also, if you're using this green laser and I point it in your eye for 10 seconds, you're going to have temporary blindness. If you do it a little longer, you're going to go blind. They just used, China used it recently on a Philippine fishing boat. So these can be some serious things. This is not, this is a low powered one, but a high powered laser that's going to scare a goose away from a couple hundred yards is also going to cause eye damage. So I, I would caution, unless it's handheld and you're controlling it, I wouldn't use a laser for that purpose. Border collies are great. They have, just like geese have instincts, they have an instinct to chase geese. They, they herd, they herd birds and stuff. Um, they also are good if you have a trained border collie, you don't have to worry about running afoul of the law by harming a geese. Don't take your, um, I don't know, what's, I, I don't know anything about dogs, the German Shepherd. Don't take a German Shepherd, take it off the leash and let it send it at the geese. Because the geese at first might try to fight back and it's going to lose that battle. I've had to remove a goose or two from an over-anxious dog owner, um, a dead goose or two. Dogs need to cover the water too. If the geese will literally, like in this picture, they'll just go right, if this dog doesn't swim after them, they're gonna go right out into the water and wait. And they're gonna just hang out. Yes? You haven't mentioned drones at all, either aerial or aquatic. I'm a drone flyer myself, licensed, part 107. It, it, you can't use drones, it's illegal. You cannot you use- You Yes. <laughs> What's that? Yes, if I, you attach a dog collar to the drone. <laughs> no, but no no drones, and I don't know why. Um, I think I mentioned that a little later. No, not the next slide, but um, that's a question for April Simnor. But drones are not allowed to, you're not allowed to use drones. You can use remote-controlled boats, a remote-controlled car, and if you have the means, a remote-controlled hovercraft, but you're not allowed to use flying drones. Oh, flying drones. So you could use an aquatic boat. A, a boat. A boat. Yeah, remote control, an RC boat or something. But you're saying drones are totally illegal to use a drone? You are not allowed to. I don't know the. Again, I'm not the legal expert. Okay. Not, we actually have one, but you're not up on drone law. But yeah, uh, April said. April specifically said not to use drones. Aerial. Aerial drones. Aerial drones. Yeah. When I think of a drone, yeah, I think of aerial. So these dogs need to chase across your whole lake. Um, uh, if you have a, a small lake, a couple of um, acre, two acres, the dog could probably swim, and a border collie trained to swim will do the job. If you have a 66 acre lake, you're going to need a boat, and you're going to need to put the dog in the boat. You don't need to do it every time. The geese may fly away when they see the dog, if the dog has been in the boat and chased them across the lake. Tapes and lines are super effective and simple. Twisted mylar, any type of breeze, that's going to reflect light in a weird pattern. It doesn't even need to be twisted mylar. Um, my house in 2010, when we had that flock of 70, I just hung a line 12 to 18 inches up along my front, and then the geese walked up my neighbor's property through a little pathway we have and on the mine, so I put the line up on his house, geese gone. They just don't want to have to do that extra flight up between their water and the lawn. They'll take a 12 to 18 inch rock barrier, they'll, they'll, they'll hop up onto that, but they don't want to do an actual takeoff and landing. It's inefficient. Remember, they're eating grass. It's not, I mean, they, you know how much grass they need to eat to get their calories? I think they poop out 90% of what they eat because it's just yeah, inert. That's it's, it's why we have such problems on our beaches. So a simple line can protect it. Just make sure that you don't give them an alternative way around your line. The line needs to be complete along the the perimeter. You can't put a line up on your beach and then let your swim wall go unprotected. They'll just walk over. Orange fencing and stuff works really well too, but it's ugly. Who wants big orange fencing up for three, three or four months of the year? So use, use, consider some lines like this. If you were lucky enough that you only have a narrow pathway to your lake and woods surrounding it, that's perfect. We're, our, at Cupsaw Lake, we're a peninsula. It's impossible to, to cover the whole thing. Uh, that's me with binoculars there during a goose chase. My daughter is very excited to be out on a goose chase with me. Um, yeah, the kids think I'm a little crazy, um, but gotta do what you gotta do. So 
Yeah, we actually start chasing with ice out because that's when the geese start coming. This is actually my personal style and happy to talk about it at the end if anyone has specific questions on kayaking and chasing. But it, the key is you want a team. You want it to be consistent each morning, each evening. Uh, that's any type of harassment should be done like that. So the reason I ended up going in the boat is I can get them off the entire lake. So um, I follow them. There's a dog team that we work together. So the dog team chases them off the beach in the morning. If I'm not awake, I'm close enough to where the beach is that I'll hear the geese in my sleep wake up and get in that boat and chase them, finish them off the, the, the rest of the lake. I bring binoculars out there to make sure they leave and they don't just land on another part of the lake. If they land on another part, I'm going to keep chasing them. Um, I also track their patterns so I know when they're coming and going, like when I go to work. So maybe I adjust my work schedule or um, get out a little later. Are they coming at night? Sometimes they'll just come to sleep on your lake. That's not a good thing though. You don't want them to get. The one big downside is it's very labor intensive. 3,000 trips is average about 300 a year. That's at least 200 hours I'm spending. Now I like the exercise, so find some gym person or someone who likes the exercise, and maybe they, they can incorporate it into their routine. Can you be more specific when you're chasing them? Like, what exactly are you doing? Are you paddling fast up to them? Or? You know, I, I wasn't sure I could go into that. I don't have a slide on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I do. So, it depends where they are. So if the dogs have chased them off the beach, the geese need time to organize. A, an immediate threat to them, they're going to scatter, but they're not going to leave your lake. They actually need to have a conversation. And this is where I go a little into crazy town. But uh, <laughs> the geese will, they have symbols, they, just like us. Literally, no. Let's get out of here. Two of that is, let's get out of here, that's no. So uh, so what I'll do in the boat is I will not, I used to just run at them, right? I had full steam, anger, banging the side of the boat, making noise, my daughter beyond, clapping something, and they go 30 yards away. And then we go again, bang, bang, bang. Now uh, I kind of I kind of hang back, I sit back, I let them talk, I wait for them to do that, I might even nod my head. <laughs> I'm, I'm just supporting that one goose that wants to leave. You know, they, the ones that are saying no, I want to support that one that's like, let's get out of here. I want them to know I don't quit, and I don't. So, um, we want the video. What's that? We want the video. It's, no one's allowed to take the video. <laughs> but it's, um, it, it is a complicated process, but I will say, hang in their vicinity, let them group together, and let them talk about it. You don't, it doesn't need to take long. A minute or two of you threatening them by your presence before they take off, means they might organize enough to do a full flight off. When they get shocked, they're just, it's, it's sort of like when you touch something hot. If you've ever seen the slow motion videos, your hand instinctively pulls back before your brain has a chance to realize you're touching something hot. The geese are like that too. If you scare them right away, they're just gonna instinct scatter. But if you remain a constant threat, only for a few minutes, they're gonna take that and then wanna leave. I have a, uh, a red laser that I'll use at night or maybe, you know, actually something similar to this that I'll use at night, uh, low light hours. So if they're on someone's yard, I can move them off the yard into the water, and then I got them. It's a little bit opposite of traditional hazing techniques where it's land-based. Being water-based means I take away the lake from them, and they have to go to a land to, to evade me. So that's uh, very effective. I'll splash with the paddle. I'll smack around. That stuff doesn't matter. They get used to that way too quick. But really, it's just about letting them know you're there. And the geese that know me... I will sometimes, from 200 yards away, put my boat in the water, and before my boat is fully in the water, they have left. They know it's coming. They are smart. They adjust. But they also know I'm going to go to work at some point. <laughs> and they know I have to make money. You don't live lakefront for free. Um, I love this sign. This is just people getting used to the goose problem, right? Don't use the door. And look at that guy. He's not going to let you out. Um, but this green laser, red laser, is very effective in low light, but you have to be real careful. You don't want to be shining that up on anyone. It works on land. Uh, if you have a yard or something, you can just shine it in your yard. They'll move away from it. Um, if you never chase them, though, they can get used to the light. If they don't really want to move, they'll get used to it then, too. 
when you get them off the land, follow them in the water. And then what I was just saying here, uh, there you go. Actually, I guess I did cover it. Yep. Get them to argue. Get them to shake that head. When you see them start doing that, that's it. Now, now you can do it and don't use that drone. That's from Nathan Sibnor. If you really want to use a drone, ask her. There might be a way to do it. I don't know of one. She said avoid it. I've heard of companies coming out and spraying the area with some kind of natural Yes. Current. Does that actually work? Like grape yeah. scented. Yeah. I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll just like two steps. No, no problem. I like it. No, no, it's good. We're, we're interacting. It's perfect. So now we talked about site aversion. You saw this slide earlier. But here's where it's going to come into play. Mating. This is where they will start looking to pair off. It starts in February. So as soon as your lake has ice out, you can begin harassing them on water. It, it, on a winter like this, the geese came early. They were coming at the end of February. Cupsaw Lake was 46 degrees on February 16th. We're, we're below that now, but it was such a warm early February that I mean, we even had turtles coming out of the water, which is about four weeks ahead of schedule. I'm sure many of your lakes saw some early spring activity. You might even have some weeds starting to grow in the lake that you don't see uh, this early. But the, this is their season, and it's your season. From February, really, till June, that's prime time. That's where these phases are all happening. It's actually a short four-month period. Actually, I don't even need to worry about the molt. It's really these three phases that you can affect. If you haven't gotten rid of them by the molt, they're staying. You either need to round them up or, um, well, or live with them. <coughs> But what doesn't get taught too much is the fall. This is when they pond hop and forage. If you do a roundup, the fall is going to be a great time for you to keep the geese off your lake. That's when other geese that, have, uh, that are juveniles are getting crowded out of their other territory are going to look for a new spot, and your empty lake is going to be that new spot. So even a, a yearly roundup is not going to solve your problems. So here's just, uh, this is really, I just spoke to most of this. This is really for someone that's going to look at the slideshow later on. Um, I'll leave it up just for a second. Not too much new here. So habitat modification. We talked about site aversion. Site aversion is you actively making the geese uncomfortable. Habitat modification is something probably none of us will do. It's really expensive. It should be considered, though, if you're redesigning something of your waterfront. Uh, what you're trying to do here is actually modify your ground to make it less attractive to the geese. Before I go back, this is just a planting buffer. The geese don't want to go through those plants. They're not going to want to wade through it. And flying over it is an extra hop they don't want to take. It just makes it a little less desirable. A lot of lakes have this one barrier, and then it's onto the yard. You actually need three steps if you're going to want the geese. They have no problem going up 8 to 12, 12 to 18 inches off that first barrier, but they don't want to do three hops. Again, they're trying to conserve energy. They're eating grass. They're not getting, although in April, we'll start eating your weeds, and that gives them a lot of energy. Creating that, so really it's that bower, eating barrier. Even a deck could work. Uh, you put that deck in there instead of uh, having a smooth path into the water. But again, these aren't very realistic things. They're just what the book says. For the, uh, the plant barrier two slides ago, what's the uh, horizontal distance that, that's necessary to dissuade them? I don't know that there's an official number, but at least three feet. Three. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure the more the better, right, with anything, just about anything. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd say at least three feet. And that's, I think, that's what, that doesn't have the dimensions on it, but the plan I took that from, that's uh, some Oregon-type plan, uh, had, it said three to six feet. <coughs> Habitat modification is feeding. I know that's more of a behavior, but I don't call it site aversion to stop feeding, because you're not really chasing them away if you don't feed them. Um, you got to stop people from feeding, feeding the geese. If they say they're doing it out of love, this is what happens. You can have a goose that can no longer fly. You pretty much, what's the word, not mutilated it, but you've, uh, you've really damaged the goose by giving it a poor diet. So don't feed them. It brings in more geese. It makes your geese more aggressive. You can't necessarily stop someone unless you have a town ordinance. Um, I don't know if counties get into this, but I know a lot of towns do. Ringwood does, um, and your town should as well. So if you don't have a town ordinance, definitely send someone to the borough and tell them to get that ordinance. They should have no problem putting that in. And then the sign. So this is helpful. Don't feed the waterfowl. This is really more helpful, and you can't see it here. 
maybe a little here. We want to talk about the reasons why you don't feed. People will think it's just another law that is uh, taking away their rights and they, it gives their grandson such pleasure to feed the geese together. But if you give them some of the reasons, let them know they're harming the geese, maybe you'll have a, a better reaction, maybe not. But at least have the sign up. People come through our lake that just have no idea. They, they say, well, we didn't realize we were harming the lake, harming the geese by feeding them. This is, I think, what you were talking about. This is uh, a product you can put at the end of your hose. You can spray it on the grass. Um, it actually does work pretty well. It's just expensive. You need to do multiple applications after every rain. It doesn't stick to the grass. Um, the ultraviolet reflecting stuff, I wouldn't go with that. It's, the geese don't see ultraviolet, so I'm not sure why that would work to begin with. But shiny reflective grass is, I don't know, it's not even attractive to humans. So if it's, if it's unattractive to geese, it's going to be unattractive to humans. So I would stick with that grape spray if you want to try it out. But again, geese will get used to it. They may not eat your grass, but they'll like your grass because it gives them a good takeoff, good 360 degree view. It's not just all about eating because around this time of year, curly leaf pond weed is probably plaguing half the lakes, of, half the lakes in this room. So uh, that's a good food for the geese. They love it. it. Gives them nutrients, energy. So now we'll talk about some of the lethal options. This is if all your other non-lethal options have failed. Um, we'll start with egg addling. It's the least controversial, but it can still be a little controversial. And then uh, we'll talk about getting rid of the grown geese, getting the permit. Uh, your roundups are going to be done when the geese can't fly. Again, it's in that season. June into July, it, the geese are starting to adjust their molting season. So I've seen geese fly as late as early July and then pick up flying again in mid-July. Not the same goose. They'll adjust their patterns as they need to. Oh, and just one other thing. Uh, I know we've talked about this a little. I don't know about hunting and permits. I don't do it myself, so it's not going to be covered in this per uh, presentation. But if you're in a lake where they allow hunting, Typically, our seasons are aligned with migratory geese, but I believe there's a September one that you might be able to hunt uh, or shoot resident geese. But uh, as far as hunting, I'm not the expert on that. I would reach out to April Simnor you, or the uh, NJDEP or Fish and Wildlife, whoever gives you those, those hunting permits. They'll tell you what, where you can and cannot do that. So egg addling is what you're trying to do is make the egg unviable. You just don't want the egg to hatch. Um, the most common method is coating it in food grade oil, corn oil and it's important that it's food grade corn oil. That's uh, the preferred oil. It's um, the one recommended by the Humane Society. But what you're basically doing there is you're preventing the exchange of oxygen through the eggshell. It's important that the goose thinks the egg is viable. Otherwise they will just, if you take the eggs away and make an omelet, they're going to come back and make another nest. They realize that their eggs are gone and they'll be able to have time for a second uh, clutch or a second mating on that. You can, it's actually legal, you can puncture the egg, you can shake the egg. I find that a little difficult because I think corn oil is the best. You won't know if you shook it enough and puncturing it might let the goose know. And uh, those eggs get real ugly real quick when they're punctured. The nesting season, it's now till May and you will sometimes get someone who doesn't even like the egg addling program. Um, the Humane Society, and I'll post this link uh, after the presentation online, uh, has a great fact sheet explaining how egg addling works and why it's necessary. Uh, some tips, you will need a partner with you. You're not, you need to get the geese off the nest. Um, the mother or father will defend it. An umbrella is a great tool. I actually use this sometimes out in the water when the geese are getting really ornery. The, uh, they don't like the umbrella. You open it and close it or keep it open and go like this. It's a real good blocker and it'll keep them from thinking they can take you. Um, so you have one person with the umbrella keeping the goose away and you can go and addle the eggs, take your time. If you are going to tell people you're following the Humane Society guidelines, you should probably follow them. And if you are doing that, this is from them. This isn't from the government or anything. So this is just if you make Humane Society part of your goose management plan to win over the resistors to the plan, there's a simple float test. And basically, if it can float, don't coat. So four, five, and six, you see the egg at the surface of the water. They're not going to want you to coat. But in the first two weeks when the egg sinks, I don't even know the... Uh, the physics of that, why, why it does that. 
Uh, it, geese don't always sit on their nest. I, I, we like to think that, but geese will sometimes lay a nest in a spot and then leave it. So if you come across eggs, it's pretty much, if it fills up your whole hand, it might be a swan egg, but a, a goose egg is going to be bigger than a mallard or the common eggs we see in the chicken eggs that we see in the food store. Oh. Our last option here is roundups. This is, um, these are the ones that you can't hide. You might think you're hiding it, but you don't want someone to find out by a surprise. Um, you're technically supposed to have a harassment program in place. There's no real measure of a harassment program, uh, but you should have that program in place. The USDA will ask, are you harassing the geese? Are you taking measures besides, they don't want to just come in and kill them every year. They want to know that you're doing a harassment plan. If you work with a professional vendor, that will qualify. Even if they only come one, once a week and it's completely ineffective, at least you're trying and that will qualify you for a harassment plan. Uh, but the roundup's the most controversial part. You can't really hide this. They're not being relocated. Um, it's not 1990. People can go on the internet. They can go to one of these sites and they'll tell them exactly what's happening to their geese. You used to be able to get a little away with it a little bit more. Um, and if you plan to do it, again, I'll post this link as well. It's the uh, depredation permit that you'll need to get. It's pretty complicated. I've never filled one out myself, Alan. I don't think you have, right? April did it for us. Yeah, he did it. Or whoever it was, uh, Kim Clapper back in the day. Uh, so really, it's it's the vendor I talked to quoted 450 just to do the permit. So it's uh, a pretty lengthy process. Uh, if you want to try filling out the permit yourself, you're more than welcome to. But I would work with either the USDA or a professional vendor since they're going to be the ones doing the roundup. After the roundup, you've uh, you've removed the geese, and now your deterrents are going to work much better especially site aversion. Habitat modification may or may not affect, but site aversion will look better because the geese coming to your area have been forced out of another and you have a chance now to keep them from calling your lake home. After the roundup, August, November really becomes key critical after a roundup because that's when the geese will explore. And if they're coming by your lake, getting good food and not having to fight other geese, it's gonna be very attractive to them and they're gonna stay there. Your spring determinants should, should work uh, better, and you may even find that the geese that you rounded up and got rid of were nesting in odd places, and the geese that come in have now found your peninsulas and islands. It makes it easy for you to addle your eggs. So if you have a goal, a goose goal set at four or six geese, they can nest, you can addle their eggs, and you don't have to worry about the population exploding again. So here's two of the resources. Again, I'll, I'll post this all online. Uh, but this is really what I got, some, besides my own experience, I talked to April at the USDA, I talked to the NJDEP, they weren't that helpful. The private companies are somewhat helpful, they've given me some quotes on how to do it. Feel free to shop around, again, your plan, if you have a plan before you shop for the, the goose vendor, they'll understand and make their activity match your plan, rather than just come in and tell you what they need to do. Don't let them tell you what to do, it's your lake. You know the spots a lot better than they do. And then last uh, is this. It's a great document. You can look it up. It's um, very extensive. It's probably 60, 70 pages. So I'm leaving you with, uh, you know, this is a controversial topic. And the point is, make the plan to get rid of some of that controversy. Bring everyone into the tent. Talk about it. Bring in a facilitator if you need to. Goose management's not just done with addling and roundups. It is a year-round activity, although you do get breaks in the winter when it's snowy and icy and the geese move south with the snow line. And you might get a break if you're successful um, after the molt or during the molt and then shortly after. At Cupsaw, we usually enjoy the geese leave in early June and don't come back. Well, they don't come back at all, but they start showing up in August, but maybe they show up once or twice a month through August, September, November or August, September, October, and then November, we start seeing the, the foragers come by as they get displaced from cold or something else. Um, and no single plan will work. I would send out my plan to everyone, but it's probably not gonna work for your lake. And if all else fails, April Simnor or the NJDEP, reach out to the government, animal control even, and they'll reference you to the right place. You're not on your own. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. So my lake, um, we, fill out the permit and we actually have a hunter dispatch the geese uh, in the spring. The only real pushback we've had is that we had some anti-gun sentiment. They didn't want any guns going off at the, at the lake, which, you know, 
it's, it's understandable, of course. I was wondering if there are other methods of dispatching that uh, either Kate just uses or that you've heard are as effective. Well, the, the roundup would work, but then you got to live with the geese right up till June. Well, so what happens, so the roundup, they don't just shoot the geese? No, the they wait till the geese cannot fly. So during the molt. How do they kill the geese? They gas them. Yeah. yeah. So they usually yes. cart them away and then uh, they gas them. Uh, the, you saw a trailer. I've also heard of a truck where the exhaust goes into the back where the geese are. Uh, Basically, you're doing the same thing with the adult you're doing with the eggs. You're depriving them of oxygen and and taking that away. With the gun thing, yeah, I mean, <laughs> first of all, I'm envious. We're not shooting guns off at our lake at all. Uh, what season do they hunt them in? Um, in the spring. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. I, like I said, the hunting I'm unfamiliar with, but if the residents are complaining about the gunshots and stuff, uh, you know, invite them in to talk about the plan. Tell them what you're trying to do. Maybe they can help with that. Anyone else have any questions? Yes. Talked about Cutshaw Lake having two, uh, zero to four, which is zero to two nesting pairs. I presume those are non, uh, non migratory. Do you have a migratory issue associated with flights in and out during the spring and fall? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, maybe occasionally a group will land. I know what the migratory geese look like. They're small, they're nimble, and they're drinking. As soon as they land, they're drinking from our lake. You can tell they've been flying for a while. They don't stay there very long. No, nope, I don't even bother harassing them. I mean, they still spend the night. Yeah, they overdue. Then we got a problem. <laughs> but I don't mind a couple hours. That's a rest stop. I'm cool with a hotel on that. Yes, in the back. On your lake, are you basically the only one doing this? No, I'm not. I'm the only one. Obsessed with it. <laughs> you know, I like to say I'm putting my OCD to a good use, but um, no, I'm not. They, we have a team of, uh, we, I work with a lady from the Humane Society. She really helped with the plan, and getting this off the ground was mostly due to her. Getting the community to, to settle down, and we work together. She knows I hate geese. She knows it. I, I'll do whatever it takes to keep geese off the lake. I don't want, to, I don't want a kid dying from an infection or anything like that. Uh, but we work together, and she's the one who runs the dog program and the poop patrol. So really, all I have to do is kayak in the morning, which I do anyway. So and it's is not. The dog program an outside vendor, or is it local dog? Well, she's she actually works for the Humane Society. She's not just like a card carrying member or something. She works there, so uh, she trains them herself. She's that type of person. So we got lucky with that. She's she's like an actual employee of, of the Humane Society. And besides her, she's trained now other people's dogs. It doesn't always have to be a border collie, but the dog should be trained so it doesn't uh, kill the geese. Yes? Would you be willing to share a copy of that plan so that we can mimic what works potentially rather than rebuild from scratch and cross our fingers? Yes. Um, I have a card or something, but I'll send it out individually. I don't want to post it online. As you can imagine, posting anything goose-related online can invite more scorn than it alleviate. But speaking to the plan and knowing it works well. Anyone else? Questions? No? I think that's it. Yes, it is. All right. Thanks for your time today.